Hello and good morning. Uh, today is April the 29th. Uh, it is a Wednesday and we continue our discussion today uh, with the age of revolution and reason. No. The age of revolution and romanticism. I was just talking about the age of reason uh, in my AP Euro class. So, yes, revolution and romanticism. <clears throat> um, we are once again have our test Friday. Um, we will finish up this unit by tomorrow, quite comfortably so. Um, but it is a good day to be on the inside. Hopefully, uh, you notice the pictures I put on uh, Canvas. I intend to put a couple more um, from Eugene Delacroix. Uh, <clears throat> and I also put some on yesterday, Eugene Delacroix's The Lion Hunt, Eugene Delacroix's um, the, uh, Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leads the People, which is, uh, his classic, uh, which I will have to, I will promise to put that on there for you, uh, because, uh, it takes some explaining, uh, and unfortunately you don't have your textbooks, I can't show you, uh, but anyway, um, Delacroix was inspired by Byron uh, about revolts and revolutions uh, and produced several pictures of colorful art reminiscent of the spirit of the French Revolution. But if you look at the uh, Liberty Leads the People, many people, when they see that picture, Liberty Leads the People shows the woman with the French flag over her head and her shirt is torn off and she's looking back, urging her fellow Frenchman onward to fight against tyranny. Many people think that has to do with the French Revolution. That's absolutely wrong. It has to do with, there were a series of riots in Paris in 1830 against the French king. But yeah, it was not the French Revolution. It was a later uprising. Uh, in fact, and I have never watched this, um, Les Miserables, Les Miserables, Les Miserables, the famous play, musical play that became uh, like three musical adaptation of films. One of those musical adaptations has Russell Crowe, that's right, Russell Crowe, uh, Maximus from Gladiator, singing, and it's really, he's really awful. You know, well, I can't talk, you know, uh, but still. But anyway, um, I will put, I will edit my uh, posting today on Canvas and we'll put Liberty Leads the People. It is a famous painting. Um, and if you look at that painting, uh, you see all of the characters. And it's a perfect romantic painting because all of the characters are just flexed. You see Liberty up there, her shirt is ripped off and she doesn't care. The flag is flapping in the wind, but it's tattered. Obviously it's been subjected to gunfire. You see, you know, uh, people with muskets, you see Liberty stepping on dead bodies, you see, uh, and by the way, Liberty, um, that Liberty, the woman, the French idea of Liberty is a female. Uh, the spirit of Liberty is a female from Greek mythology. And um, in fact, it's the same person that stands in New York Harbor, that Liberty. Remember that Liberty, the Statue of Liberty was a gift from the government of France to the United States uh, that stands uh, there in New York Harbor. 
Uh, and that's the same personage. That liberty, that statue uh, was, or that copper statue is also uh, copper, bronze, I don't know what it's made of, cast iron, maybe, uh, was also liberty, and liberty leads the people. In fact, uh, in a number of political cartoons, France itself will be portrayed as this female, the idea of liberty. But yeah, uh, liberty leads the people. I will have to show you that, I promise. Uh, uh, I'll put it on either today or tomorrow's canvas. Today's probably. But you do need to become familiar with it and know why it's romantic. It's romantic because, you know, all these people, are, their muscles are flexed. They have their musket in their hand. Have a little boy with two pistol, a little boy with two pistols, you know, ready to go out and fight the forces of tyranny, fight the soldiers. There's smoke in the background. I mean, you know, it's a romantic type of uh, art. Remember that romanticism focuses on several things. It focuses on the macabre. It focuses on nature. It focuses on uh, passion. It focuses on action. You know. It is, it is my favorite uh, type of art. Okay. Romantics also protested social and political injustice. For example, our friend Lord Byron, the guy who used to live with Percy Shelley and Mary Shelley in Italy and would sit around and drink alcohol, tell each other scary stories. And Lord Byron hears about this revolution in Greece where in his mind and in the minds of many Europeans at the time, the Greeks were wanting to cast off the forces of Ottoman Turkish tyranny. And so they went, um, Percy, or rather Lord Byron and several people like him, went to actually fight in this war. Can you believe that? I mean, you see, a lot of people back then had a very romantic view of what war was like. And I don't know how that happens. Uh, you know, and it's happened, I mean, it, it happened in literally every war through, well, up till Vietnam, after Vietnam, out the door. But imagine, you know, lots and lots and lots of people, a war breaks out and young males just think they got to go. Uh, oftentimes they do have a romanticized version of it. They think it's going to be, you know, like a, a Cub Scout trip, a camping trip with guns where they get to shoot the other people, but they don't shoot back. And if they do shoot back, they're bad shots anyway. Uh, they forget about the fact that in between those glorious battles where you are standing next to somebody and suddenly their head is torn off their body, There are long periods of boredom. And remember, you, when you're there, you're not staying at the Hilton. You are outside. And it's cold. And there's rain. And there's rats. But, and I'm, I know I'm rambling here. I know I'm off the subject. But, you know, that, that's also the essence of romanticism. The belief that going off and fighting in such a... Such a situation, taking part in that would be a grand adventure. And it was all about adventure. Romanticists are adventurers. Um, romanticism came about the time, the height of the Industrial Revolution in England. And that's why romanticism fit in so well. The Industrial Revolution was boring. And not only was it boring, it was grueling. And it was mundane, and it was the same thing every day. And to oppose that, you have these stories about grand adventures, these colorful characters like Last of the Mohicans, you know, in North America and the French and Indian War, you know, um, these sweeping plains and these noble savages, uh, Hawkeye, Chingachgook. Uncas saving these two women and uh, Major Duncan Hayward from certain annihilation. You know, those kind of romantic things. Uh, but anyway, 
so in such an environment as the Industrial Revolution, which made a lot of money for a few people. And by the way, that's a question on your test, the Industrial Revolution. It makes a lot of money for a few people. And it does kind of elevate, and it does eventually. The, the Industrial Revolution, as you should know, did elevate the standard of living for the great majority of people which made a lot of money for the few, also victimized the many. Uh, you know, to dig that coal, to turn those uh, cotton threads, cotton fiber into clothing, um, took a lot of work, tedious, 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 and dangerous work. And so, in such an environment, which made a lot of money for the few, also victimized the many, the workers who lived in crowded, dangerous tenements and then w went and worked at crowded factories <coughs> for little money and less hope for the future. You know, uh, Mr. Halleck, last Christmas, FX produced a version of A Christmas Carol. The, 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 the story, A Christmas, you know my favorite story, Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge, Bob Cratchit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it was very, very, very dark, uh, the, in, uh, the story of Christmas Carol. You know, and Edgar, or rather, Charles Dickens, I said Edgar Allan Poe, forgive me, uh, Charles Dickens writes this story, Christmas Carol, which is about uh, how in industrial era London, this Ebenezer Scrooge, this uh, miser, comes to the realization that his greedy ways are wrong. Well, I mean, the FX version, which happened, which was telecast over Christmas, told the same story slightly differently. It told a story, um, and, you know, it, it exposed Ebenezer Scrooge uh, to his many injust injustices, and one of those injustices was uh, he was partial owner in a coal mine, and to save money, and this, this kind of thing happened, to save money, to save money, um, Ebenezer Scrooge and his co-owner, Bob Marley, not Bob Marley, Jacob Marley, Bob Marley. I shot the shit. No, Jacob Marley. Uh, Jacob Marley, uh, they shorted, meaning they didn't spend enough money on safety in the mine. For example, they didn't put up enough oak beams to support the miners, to support the weight of the cave. And the result, of course, one day caved in, killed a large number of miners. And by the way, and those things happened. Trust me. It happened in the United States, too, where they didn't shore up uh, the mine, <coughs> the deep mine enough. It had, I do remember it happened. And forgive me, I'm rambling again. Uh, there was an instance uh, out west in a silver mine. Colorado, Wyoming, I don't know. <coughs> and um, hundreds of miners were trapped inside this silver mine. They were all Chinese. And you know what the owners did? Sealed the mine. Left them in there. Um, what's next, guys? But anyway... Uh, you know, in this story, A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge is called to remember the fact that he didn't spend enough money buying the uh, oaken uh, supports for this mine. And like I said, uh, an entire town's population of males uh, were killed. And there was no such thing as insurance for these people. You know, when the father and the brothers and whatever of the family were dead, those women were destitute. And Ebenezer Scrooge was forced to look at that. Uh, so, yeah, 
the Industrial Revolution made a lot of money for a few people, but also victimized the many. And over time, it over time, over time, it does raise the standard of living. There's going to be a question about this. Over time, it does raise the standard of living, Mr. Pugh, um, for the many who labored in the coal mines and the factories for a little money. And also, you know, it was drudgery. <clears throat> I may have told you this. Back a long time ago in land far, far away, during the summers, I would work in the summertime between college semesters. I mean, between college in, in summer. I work at this place called uh, uh, Simco, Southeastern Metal Corporation. They made school furniture. They took, you know, steel and parts, uh, you know, and assembled them into desk, things of that nature for schools. You know, it was, I say, you know, you know, you know, it was uh, for a, uh, you know, a college student, it was uh, okay money for the summertime. I didn't, I was happy to get it, but I was more than happy to get it over with because, you know, the hard work didn't bother me. I was a runner, that, you know, meaning I went and got stuff for people, made sure that people had the supplies they need to assemble the chairs. The people on the assembly line, though, they would spend the entire day doing one thing. Uh, it would start with a guy at the front whose job it was to take a frame of a, like a, for example, a school chair and <clears throat> in intervals put them uh, on the assembly line. Then there'd be two other guys down there who would take uh, those chairs, flip them over, and there were these things called carpet glides. Uh, there are these little round things that glide on the carpet. Paint. They would hammer those in, pop that thing back on the conveyor belt, and it would go down, you know, seats, backs. They had the, they had the mnemonic drills, stampers or whatever. And, you know, by the time it gets to the end of the line, it's a chair or a desk or whatever. Then it's, you know, loaded up and categorized and whatever. And all summer, they all year, I did that for a summer. They did that for a year. And once again, it wasn't the work that I minded. You know, even though it was minus, it was the fact that, you know, I could tell that for these people, they had done that for years. They were going to do that for the rest of their lives. You know, and that was it. And then when they had breaks, all they'd talk about is a lot of them were alcoholics. Um, they would talk about redneck music, sex, and um, Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. And that's it. I rode with a bunch of them. You know, I, we'd have to get up, at goodness, have to leave the house at like ugh, five o'clock in the morning to get down there in Birmingham. And I wrote with the guys, they're nice people, good men. And on the way down, they would just rattle on about sex, uh, country music, bad country music. I mean, Merle Haggard, help me. Uh, and, you know, that. And so that was it. When it says that with little hope for the future, you know, their life was monotonous. And I was so happy to get out of that. You know, but work is work. Uh, for example, it says their workers did starve in Dickensian England. Dickensian, that means the England of Charles Dickens, of the industrial era <coughs> of the 18th centuries, 18th and early 19th century. Women turned to prostitution to support families. And um, it is estimated that in Victorian England, which goes from about 1830 about 1900 Victorian England um, when, you know, England was supposed to set the standard for gentlemanly, civilized societal behavior, one in three, one in three women 
supplemented the family's income through the prostitution. Why? Because it was titillating. Why? Because it was glamorous. Why? Because they got to wear fancy clothes. The answer to all those questions is a resounding no. They needed the money. While that society, of course, is the act, kind of activity was condemned by polite society, men of all walks of life, including, <coughs> including the wealthy, sophisticated classes, utilized the trade. And the money kept many poor children alive. It was Victoria's secret. William Blake uh, was such a romantic hero who championed the cause of working poor in London's industrial uh, districts. Uh, I mean, also Charles Dickens also Charles Dickens uh, kind of bridges the gap between romanticism, because Christmas Carol's romantic, but he also gets into the next type of writing we're going to talk about, which is realism. I mean, in Charles Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol, and also in Great Expectations, uh, the book is, a, even though it's a rom classified as romantic literature, it also is a little gritty. You see the poverty, uh, you know, of the people. Um, and then there's another Charles Dickens book that you, I'll guarantee you know nothing about. It's called Bleak House. It's about a bunch of lawyers serving in London, and that's a realistic novel. By the way, and I did mention this before, Charles Dickens, like uh, Rem, the artist Rembrandt, Charles Dickens had the uh, very odd occurrence that Charles Dickens' life began in wealth. He was, you know, his family was wealthy. But during his young life, his family fell upon hard times and they lost uh, that wealth. And so Charles Dickens and his family had to move from wealth into the impoverished areas of London which is one reason why Charles Dickens can write so well about Ebenezer Scrooge and his fear of being poor. It is one of my great big fears too, by the way. Um, uh, I mean, it seriously is, you know, not to, I mean, it really is. And this coronavirus, <laughs> aside from, of course, the obvious thing. Yeah. Um, um, you know, and I hope for everybody sitting out there listening that the coronavirus is something that you hear about and you read statistics. Uh, yesterday, I found out that uh, one of the, somebody I know, somebody I knew, not from the Rao community, not from the Rao community, nobody you know, trust me. Um, but somebody out from my past who, you know, um, he didn't die, but he was on a ventilator. And you, by the way, you know that once a person goes on those ventilators, particularly they're older, chances are one in five of them coming out, getting off the ventilator. My mother spent the last year and a half of her life on a ventilator. Um, she was a smoker. Yeah, she was a smoker. By the time she died, her uh, lungs, the doctor said, had the consistency of cardboard. For all those of you who are thinking about doing that. And yeah, that's a, the more you know, said Johnny. But anyway, um, yeah, Charles Dickens uh, is, one of my is one of my favorite writers. But uh, yeah, he, uh, like I said, bridges the gap between romanticism with Christmas Carol uh, great expectations, but also he gets into reality with Bleak House. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, because, yeah, he, uh, his, he understood both sides of the coin. William Blake, once again, was such a romantic hero who championed the cause of the working poor of London's industrial districts. Blake wrote the poem London, which condemns the institutions of the day. Uh, the institutions of 
industrialized London or industrialized society of living in small industrial compartments and working in a monotonous, dangerous job for almost nothing. Yeah, that is killing the spirit of mankind. Okay. We are going to end here. And we will pick up tomorrow and finish the unit tomorrow. You have a test Friday over this uh, class. And it is timed. And so, yeah, there. I think that we'll cover one more unit on realism and impressionism. <sighs> Two kinds of art that I'm like, oh, I really don't like it. But we'll cover it. And so, yeah, um, I think that's all for me. As usual, it's been good talking to you all. I have to remember now to go find Liberty Leads the People and give you a sample of it. Bye for today.